In this video, I'm going to show how I made these cheese slicers from select hardwoods. These cheese boards are a fun and easy project. Great for a beginner, and they're a great gift idea. They can be as simple as using a single board, but for these, I'm going to make three different ones using a blend of domestic and exotic hardwoods. My main reason for doing three is because I got a break on the shipping when I ordered the hardware. I was only going to make one for my nieces, but then after seeing the price of the shipping for one, it made more sense to buy three and then sell the other two. I'm starting by cutting all my pieces to rough length. With all my pieces cut for this first board, I'm going to lay all my pieces out to make sure that I like the pattern. For this one, I'm using Paduke, Zebra Wood, and Purple Heart. One of my niece's favorite animals is a zebra. So naturally, I chose Zebra Wood. The piece of Zebra Wood that I have is not quite wide enough to make one of these boards, so I'm adding a strip of Paduke and a strip of Purple Heart to add to the width of the board. The piece of zebra wood that I have is also just the right length for one of these boards. But if I leave it the way that it is, then whenever I run it through my planer after the glue up, I'll end up losing some of the length due to snipe from the planer. That's why I'm adding these strips of oak to either side, so that way that the snipe will come out of the strips of oak rather than coming out of my expensive exotic hardwood. Here I'm adding a liberal amount of glue to each piece to make sure that I get good coverage between each one. Having a glue up come apart from not enough glue is very frustrating. Using my silicone glue brush, I'm spreading all the glue to make sure that I'm getting good coverage on the entire surface on each edge. I'm laying everything flat on the table. I know that I'm going to get squeeze out on the work surface, but I've got a trick that I'll show you how to clean that up. Using the tabletop as a reference point, we'll try and keep the board as flat as possible. That way, whenever I go to run it through the planer, I'm not having to take off any more material than I have to. With my clamps, I'm trying to get even pressure, but not over tighten everything. Too much pressure will cause the glue to squeeze out and not get good contact. Too little pressure, and the glue won't hold. As I'm applying the clamps, I feel like I need a fourth one. Three looks like it's pretty good, but four is even better. Once I get the clamps on here, I'll set it aside and let the glue dry. I mentioned a way for cleaning the glue off the surface of the table. Here I'm using some sawdust. I'll use it to soak up the glue, and then I can just wipe it off the table. For my second board, I'm gonna use this walnut, maple, and bloodwood. In looking through some of my recent projects, come to find out I really like this combination because this is like the third or fourth time that I've used this. Here I'm checking to make sure that I have enough of each species to make a complete board. Next, I'll rip the blood wood down to the desired width. And now I'll do the same to the walnut. Now with all my boards to the desired width and length, it's time to glue it up. Just like in the zebra wood board, I'm going to leave my end boards long, so when I run it through the planer, I don't get any snipe on the maple. The maple is just as long as I want the board to be. Since the maple is the shortest board in this glue-up, I'm going to glue both sides of it rather than putting glue on the walnut or the bloodwood. This way I don't get glue all over the place. I'm making a big enough mess as is. With the glue applied, I'll put a few clamps on it and then set it aside to dry. For the third board, I'm going to use this piece of ambrosia maple and walnut. 
Since I'm using a full board rather than boards from the cutoff bin, I can cut this one a little longer to account for the planer snipe. That way I don't have to use the long runners on either end. This board was only surfaced on the two faces. The edges were left rough. So I'll run one side through the jointer to get a smooth edge, and then I'll cut the other side on the table saw. Next I'm cutting two strips of walnut. One will go across the bottom, and the other one I'm going to use to bend a decorative curve in the board. After playing around with some different shapes and styles using my compass and my square, I finally decided to just freehand this arc. I'm trying to make the line heavy enough so that it'll be easy to follow on the bandsaw. There's nothing worse on the middle of a cut on a bandsaw to not be able to see your line and where you're going. The trick with cuts like these is both sides are use pieces, neither one of them is waste. So you need to follow the line as close as possible and not drift too far either way. Otherwise, it will leave some gaps when I insert the walnut strip and try to glue the pieces all together. Any gaps in the board will take away from the look of the project, and it will also give a place for food to get stuck. So that's why it's important to keep these as smooth as possible. Otherwise, it creates a lot more work to be cleaned up later. My thin strip of walnut is about a quarter inch wide. Probably a little thick for this application. I should have either tried to steam it or use two strips an eighth of an inch wide and laminate them together. This is going to take a lot of clamping force to hold all this together. I'm going to do a dry fit with the clamps first just to make sure that I can pull everything together. It can be really messy and frustrating to get glue all over everything and then find out that it won't pull together. Once you start pouring glue, the clock is ticking. You've only got so much time to work with it until it sets up. And that is no time to find out that you got gaps along the seam. Some of these gaps you may not find until you run them through the planer. And with that, I'll give it a little percussive persuasion to make sure that everything lays flat. Check everything out one last time. And then it's time to pull the clamps off and then give it the glue. And like the other boards, I will pour the glue. Spread the glue, clamp it all together, and set it aside to dry. And now that the boards have had more than 24 hours to sit, it's time to take them out of the clamps. Of the three boards, the ambrosia maple and walnut board was the only one that was flat enough to run straight through the planer. The other two had a bit of a wobble to them, so I'm going to have to run them through on my planer sled in order to make them flat. I'm running this one through a few times on each side until I can get it down to three quarters of an inch. Once I feel like I'm getting close, I'll check it with my caliper to make sure that I've got the desired thickness. I'll run it through one more time to get it where I want it to be. The Ambrosia Maple piece has a wormhole that goes all the way through it. I'm going to fill it with some CA glue. This will prevent food from getting trapped in the hole. Here I'm using a scrap piece of wood to work the glue down further into the hole. And then I'll flip it over and do the same thing to the other side. Here I'll pull out my planer sled to flatten the other two boards. Once I have a flat side on each one of them, then I'll break them loose and run them through the planer by themselves to get them to the final dimension. You can see here that there's a little bit of wobble corner to corner with this board. So I'll take a shim and stick it under the high spot, and then I'll use the hot glue gun to tack everything down in place. This will give me a nice even plane referencing the bottom of the planer sled as I run it through the planer. Once the hot glue dries, it will give me enough holding force to keep everything in place to get it through the planer, but not so much that I can't break it loose with a mallet and a screwdriver when I'm done. If you're enjoying this video, be sure and hit like and subscribe.
I'll give this a couple passes through the planer until this side is completely flat. And then I'll break it loose from the planer sled with the screwdriver. Then I'll flip it over and clean off any of the remaining glue. And then I'll run the other side through the planer to get it parallel on both sides. Using my caliper, I'll make sure that I've got it to the right thickness. And then I'll cut it down to size using the crosscut sled on my table saw. And I'll go ahead and cut the other two while I'm at it. Now with all the boards cross-cut to length, I will rip the runner off the zebra wood board and clean off the glue off the other side. This is what happens when your outfeed table is not close enough to your table saw. These boards are really starting to take shape. Next I need the measurement for where to cut the saw curve for the cheese slicer wire. Normally I'm not much of one for instructions, but I really don't want to screw up these boards. Here it shows the curve 3 inches from the end and 3 eighths of an inch deep. Going back to my table saw with my crosscut sled, I'm going to set my stop block 3 inches away from the blade. Then I will use two of my setup blocks. I will use the 3 eighths inch block and the 1 2 3 block. I'll set the 3 eighths inch block right next to the blade and then I'll set the 1 2 3 block on top of the 3 eighths inch block. I'll raise the blade just enough so that it touches the 1, 2, 3 block and tilts it a little bit. And then I'll back it back down until it goes back flat. With the saw adjusted where I want it, then I'll cut the curve in each board. Now I need to check the plans to see where to drill the hole for the slicer mechanism. This shows 5 and 3 quarter inches from the end and 3 eighths of an inch on center for a 3 quarter inch board. I've marked my 5 and 3 quarter inch marking on the board and now I'm lining up my dowling jig with the quarter inch hole. I will start drilling with my quarter inch bit and go as far as I can until it bottoms out on the jig. Keep backing out the drill every once in a while to clean out some of the shavings and then go a little deeper each time. Once the drill bottoms out, then I'll take the jig off and then drill the rest of the way until the drill bottoms out again on the board. This quarter inch bit isn't as long as the slicer mechanism, so once I bottom the drill out, I'll switch over to a 3 16 masonry bit. I know it's not the right bit, but it's the only one that I've got that's long enough to get deep enough for the slicer mechanism. Using my marking knife, I'll clean the drill shavings out of the saw curve. Here I'm checking the mechanism in each one of the boards to make sure that it fits and works like it's supposed to. Since the mechanism works in all of the boards, then I'm going to go through and ease all the edges before I do a final sanding. I'm setting up a quarter inch radius roundover bit, and then I'll use my 1, 2, 3 block to check to make sure that I've got it at the right height. Even though I'm fairly confident in my setup, I'm going to run a test piece through to make sure that there are no surprises. It's a lot easier to throw away a scrap piece of wood than to ruin a whole project. With my setup confirmed, I'll start going over the corners. The corners are more likely to chip out going across them with a router bit like this. So I'll start there, and then that way if there's any chip out, then I should be able to cover it whenever I turn to the other sides. With the corners done, I'll move to the end grain, getting the top and the bottom on both ends. With the end grain done, I move along to the face grain and get all the rest of the remaining edges. With all the edges rounded over, now it's time to sand everything. I lay each one out and sand each one. I'll start with 120 grit, then I'll move to 150 grit. And then finally I'll sand it with 220 grit. 
it's very important to sand through each grit. If you skip grits, it just makes the work that much harder. You should never go up more than 50% of the previous grit whenever moving to the next grit. And you should always clean off the dust and the grit from the previous sanding before moving to a finer grit. Otherwise, you run the risk of grinding grit from the previous sandpaper into the board. These scratches will show in the finish, and it doesn't look pretty. Only on the 220 grit will I round over the edges. I find that the 120 and the 150 can be way too aggressive for sanding over edges. You can really screw up a board in a hurry. After I cover every surface with the random orbit sander, with all three grits, I will switch to some hand paper and go over the saw curve. This edge is just a little rough and I just want to break it down a little so that it doesn't catch on anything. With everything sanded and cleaned off, I'll coat everything in mineral oil. I'll apply a few coats throughout the day, letting it all soak in. After giving the mineral oil about a day to soak in and saturate the board, I'll wipe off all the excess. And then I'll coat each board with some board butter from DA Marvel Woodworking. The board butter helps to condition and protect. I'll link to another video which shows more about this process. And now it's time to install the slicer mechanism for the final time. Here I'm lining up the eyelet of the slicer wire with the slicer mechanism. I'll slide the mechanism through the hole and then attach it to the other end. And then I'll attach the handle which puts the tension on the wire. I really like how these boards turned out. Thanks for watching. I really appreciate it.